music producers welcome 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 here on this saturday interview this saturday amazing day i hope it's an amazing day so far for you but uh welcome here to the channel we have a special special interview and a special guest we have our friend here let me go ahead and switch this up real quick clint music is in the building ladies and gentlemen please round of applause round of applause clint music Man, I don't think you understand how much of a pleasure it is to have you here. Uh, we have a lot of producers in the building who have questions, but we'll get to all of that once we get to know who you are. First and foremost, how are you doing today, sir? <clears throat> I'm good, bro. I appreciate you having me. Uh, feeling good, man. Feeling good. It's been a, a good week, productive week, and excited to be here, man, and, and share what I know to the community, bro. Man, and could you please share with them what you told me that was a bit of a you know, sometimes I don't know how people find my content, where they find my content, at what point they find my content. But just yeah. a little bit of a reference, since obviously they're familiar with me. Uh, yeah. A lot of them are already familiar with you, I'm sure. But how did you come in contact with my content? Um, man, just going through the the YouTube rabbit hole, man. So back back when I still you know was working nine to five, you know I would I would use my time on the commute, you know, going to and from work and, and lunch and, and things like that. Just consuming content, man, from, from people who were doing dope things, um, especially on an independent level, man. And I came across your channel um, and, and made it a point to, to consume a lot of the content that you were putting out because that was something that um, you, along with, with other people, that kept me encouraged, man, and just going through that grind um, and, and just hearing different perspectives of you know how you got to you know where you got to so yeah man that's that's how i came across man so that's shout crazy, out to you man. um i appreciate everything you know you do for the community your channel um the the curtspirations and, and all of that stuff man so, so super great. dope stuff you know when somebody sure. drops that they've been around for a second and um i i feel yeah. like i've seen you as a music producer as as this music license specialist i've seen the transition Sometimes from afar, sometimes up close, uh, we've had the opportunity to connect, and and I'm kind of like really still new to the whole Clint music. And and, and by the way, do you do you prefer Clint music or Anthony Clint Junior? What, what do you prefer? Most people just call me Clint. It's Clint. one syllable, easy okay. to remember. So yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. <laughs> Most people just call me Curtis with one S. You know, one S, <laughs> easy to remember. I, I I can relate. I can relate. But um, so. I've seen this, this so many different transitions that you've gone through, and now I'm looking at you as one of the elite, especially in micro content. I look at what you do on Instagram and how you share your content, how you even like look at this live stream. Look, look at the crispiness. First of all, the live Thank stream, you. uh, your attention to detail, I'm sure is a part of your success within music, but Give us a little bit of an origin story of how, first and foremost, you got into making music. Uh, and then we're obviously going to talk a little bit more about the music licensing. Yeah, indeed, man. So uh, I've always been around music just growing up. Um, <clears throat> you know, my parents were, were musically inclined. Um, I grew up in church, so drums was like my first instrument. And then around 15, 16, transitioning to playing keys. So that's where I got my start musically, um, you know, I guess fast forward, you know, going through that that phase. I went off to college um, at the Ohio State University. I hope we're beating Penn State right now because we are playing. <laughs> but um, yeah, that college Jack, was keep where some, I, keep some dibs on that game. Let, let us know, let us know. I, I know. Just chime in every now and then. Let us know what the score is. But uh, <laughs> college was where a lot of the the musical growth happened because you know I'm I'm from a a small town, Toledo, Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it wasn't a lot of people to glean from and, and get information from, you know, people who have made it to a, a place where you're trying to go, right? So right. I didn't have mentorship um, from where I'm from. So moving to college, going to a, a bigger city, a university, um, I was able to learn from a lot of different dope musicians and things like that. And that's where a lot of the growth happened musically, just working on my craft while working on a degree, um, playing for the African-American Voices Gospel Choir and things like that. That's wow. where the discipline to to sit down and listen to a bunch of songs, five, six, seven songs and learn them in a couple of weeks so that, you know, we can perform them for, for performances and things like that. So I kind of got the discipline there. I got the 
um, you know, the ability to, you know, um, to hone my craft as far as keys is concerned, because that's kind of like my my strong suit um, musically. So that happened, man. And I, I kind of always knew I wanted to start a production company since I was a, a teenager. Um, and I guess my plan was to start it after college and, you know, do some things after that. But then, you know, a couple years before I graduated, I was like, wait, like, what am I waiting for? Right. Like right. start it right now, start working with local artists. And that's what I did. So 2009, uh, I started Clint Productions and um, I just put myself out there, man. And um, <laughs> I remember signing signing my first agreement with the first artist I worked with, man. I did I did like a whole album for like six six hundred dollars. Yeah, I man. Days. I know those days. Oh my. So yeah, so I did that, but um, it was a good experience because I was able I was able to get experience. I was able to grow, and um, I just kept growing and growing, and um, you know, just kind of ended up in, in right places at the right time, and things kind of started to take off from there. So. So questions I always want to ask, and I usually ask this off camera for anyone that I know that came from a church background. Mm -hmm. When and we're talking about before you actually started to play music, I'm not sure how how early back that goes, but I remember being uh, in the pews and, and I would watch the choir and I would watch my mom on the piano. I'd watch the drummer. And there's that moment that occurs where you look at one of the pieces of that music and you say, I think there's something there. Like there's almost like a sparkle that happens. I'm curious if the same thing happened for you as you were kind of like just looking around. Uh, Cause we spent, I mean, I don't know about you, but my, you know, my family, we spent my, my, me and my mom, it was a lot of time in the church oh, yeah. uh, rehearsals and all kinds of stuff. sopranos, all of that good stuff. Yeah. So uh, I wonder what, what, what do you think might've sparked something there or, or did something spark something there? Yeah. Um, so I mean, in our house, so my dad was a drummer, so we had a, a drum set in our house. I got multiple un uncles who were drummers. Um, so I don't know, man. I was just drawn to, drawn to the drums first and, and just intrigued by that. Um, and then I didn't, honestly, I didn't, I never wanted to play keys, bro. Like, my parents wow. were trying to get me on an organ. I'm like, yo, that's for, that's for old people. <laughs> like, I'm good. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't want no parts of it. Um, now I love it. But, right. um, yeah, but technology happened and they they started making keyboards and the with the keyboards that i remember they bought this casio bro and you can like program the little drums mm -hmm. cheap sounding drums on the casio and that piqued my interest and i was just like i would bring that keyboard home because my parents were the the pastors right so okay i was able to bring whatever whatever i wanted home so we would bring the keyboard home and i would play with it and that's when i started getting into to beat making and things and sequences and stuff like that mm -hmm. um and then i accidentally started learning how to play keys as i was trying to play stuff to the beats and stuff that i was making so right. that that's what kind of sparked it um was the <laughs> was the casio keyboard honestly I wish I could accidentally wake up and play keys the way you do. That's that's bro. It took years. <laughs> it, it, it took a minute. <laughs> Cause you you are amazing on the keys, man. Like it, it's Thanks. to me, it's always a testament when you can go and dig back years into someone's videos and catalog, and yeah. you can see like, no, that's always been a part of your fabric. That has always been a part of who you are. So, uh, yeah, to hear you accidentally stumbling upon greatness. <laughs> um, definitely gives me encouragement, you know, as I'm starting to kind of teach myself a little bit of the lay of the land. So coming from a church background, coming from playing and you got the Casio as a part of it, your, 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 your story and fast forwarding, did you see yourself working in the traditional music industry or did you already kind of know from the jump that you would have an, uh, an, uh, non-conventional way of getting into, to creating and, and distributing your music? Yeah, that's a good question. Nah, man, I um I looked up to Dark Child, right? He was one of my favorite producers uh, growing up, and my goal was to to be industry. I was trying to be like the next Dark Child, you know mm. what I mean? So that was that was always the goal. I want to produce for all the major artists. Um, so yeah, that was that was a goal, man. I didn't I didn't know anything about sync. Like you hear music on TV all the time, but it's just like you don't think like you know, somebody can actually do that and, you know, and find their way into that space. Didn't think about it at all. Yeah. And, and just so we're clear, since we know that the, the topic around this is uh, definitely how to get your music in film and to TV, 
Could you define for us? I mean, obviously, folks can Google it. And sometimes Google can give you more confusing answers than what you <laughs> <laughs> than what you initially how, in, in a producer term. How yeah. would you define sync? How would you define music licensing for someone who is just completely new to it in the right. simplest terms? Yeah, it's given a TV show or a movie permission to use your music. <clears throat> That's Excellent. it. And then they can, you know, a lot of times there's, there's a fee attached to that. Um, there's back end royalties attached to it. So, yeah, now there's there's different ways to get into it and then there's different lanes within it. But in a nutshell, yes, it's giving someone permission to sync your music to picture. Mm, there it is. So do you remember your first introduction to that world or what that was? Yeah, so <clears throat> let's see. Back 2000, 2006, six, seven, um, a, a, a fellow Buckeye had reached out to me because during this time I was playing keys for a lot of different groups and things like that. I was posting music on, on MySpace. Um, <laughs> so Shut he had time. reached out and he was just like, yo, like I'm looking for a key player. I'm working on stuff um, for TV and film. And uh, he was like, give me a call. We'd love to link up so we can kind of collab and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I ended up calling him and he was just giving me the whole rundown. He was like, yo, like you need to check this out, check Taxi out. Like, this is what I'm doing. I'm creating this music for TV, you know, trying to pitch it to libraries and things like that. Excuse me. And um, he's just like, you should really look into it. I think it's a great opportunity. A lot of people don't really know about it and this and that. And I'm like, cool. So we ended up linking up and I would go over there. We would have sessions like on Saturdays and um, he would just pull up some some beats and I would just play keys, some stuff we would just create live. And I would just lay my part. We would do like a little eight bars and then I would leave. He would do the rest. Um, and I never really took it further than that. You know, he gave me all the information, but I was just like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the next dark child. I don't <laughs> like I'm good. You know what I'm saying? So That's I wasn't wild. thinking about it, bro. So. I would just play my keys and then I was out. Right. But then a couple years later, <clears throat> this was around uh, 2008, 2009, I revisited the idea. I started looking into taxi. A lot of people ask me about taxi and that's another conversation, but started looking into that and I was just like, you know what? I think I want to give this a try. Um, I want to give it a try. So I went up and signed up with taxi, things like that. Went to the road rally out in LA learned a ton of information man um out there and you know if if that's something you you choose to do mm -hmm. i think what really adds the value of what you pay for that is going to the road rally so i soaked in as much information as as i could man i had a notebook a pen um and just soaked it in um so i went out there started learning more about sync you know how to get you know your music placed in certain places um, and then that, after that, I was like, okay, this is, this is the goal. This is what I want to focus on. Mm. Um, so, you know, went through the process of just submit music to them and never landed anything. Um, got a couple forwards, but at the time, you know, my music, it was trash, bro. Like it was, the mix was terrible. I was producing music that I wanted to do that I thought was dope. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and not necessarily serving the client. So it was a lot of bump in my head, man. And it, it probably took you know, seven years um, before I would actually see my first TV placement. Wow, and what, do you, and what was that first placement? <clears throat> NFL Network. It was an Ooh. instrumental of uh, a song I, I recorded called I'm Taking Over. Mm -hmm. were, were you already privy to it was gonna be on there or did someone give you a heads up? Or were you just randomly watching some NFL? <laughs> How did that happen? Bruh, yeah, so, so I had, so in 2011 I moved to Atlanta and um, I had I, I signed a publishing deal with a, mm -hmm. a indie publisher. They were like out in Florida, um, so I signed this publishing deal because I seen they had a lot of TV placements. So I was like, okay, maybe this is the way in, right? Mm -hmm. So did that deal, and I think first year, first couple years, I didn't see anything. Um, so I'm up, I'm getting ready to go to the gym. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, man, let me just let me log on here, just see what's going on. Cause they would put, you know, recent placements on the front page of their website. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going on there. The little thing is scrolling. All of a sudden I see my picture. And I'm like, Whoa, like, wait a minute. <laughs> so then it said, I'm taking over, you know, uh, NFL network. And I spazzed out, bro. Like I was wow. just like, I was like, forget the workout, man. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm celebrating. Who was the first person but, you told? 
Uh, my my now wife. She was okay. my girlfriend back then. But yeah, I called her, told her, your boy was skipping to the gym. I was <laughs> I was excited, man. Uh, and that was that was a start because I ended up making, um, it, it it got placed on NFL Network. Then it got placed on Fox Sports. So I ended up making like five six hundred dollars just in royalties from that one that one instrumental. And they only right. used like I was like thirty seconds, if that. Wow. So. Yeah, after that, I was like, okay, I, I need to focus on this. To kind of piggyback off of that, you said it took you seven years to really get from making the music that satisfied you to satisfying the client. What do you think was the biggest pivot now that you have sort of that, that 2020 vision and <clears throat> the approach you had to that production in particular? Yeah. Um listening and paying attention more you know mm -hmm. realizing it's, it's not about me so let me go to where this music is being used it's being used on tv let me go watch some 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 sports you know what i'm saying let me go watch some reality tv let me watch some of the shows where i feel like my music would fit and just hear like what's working right is it right. you know is it a, a certain type of instrumentation that's being used is it you know a certain genre is it a certain tempo um, so those are the things I started to do. And then, you know, being linked with that publisher company at the time, they was they would send briefs for what they were looking for. So that kind of, you know, gave me a way to kind of, I, I guess, uh, create based off of what the client was looking for. Um, and then that's when, you know, finally, finally figured out, OK, you know, it, it's about serving at the end of the day and, and, and providing a solution. Right. So what would you say are like the pros and cons specifically for music producers? Because like you said, most music producers come in with that vision of I'm going to be the next. You said Dark Child. I want to be the next X, whatever name you want to put in there. I, for me, it was I want to be the next Kanye. That takes a different connotation today. But <laughs> I wanted to be the whoever the the, the Neptunes for real. And um, then you kind of sort of pivot because you start to recognize that. Well, if your goal is to make money or if your goal is to do things that are able to sustain your lifestyle, if your goal is to be independent, there's yeah. a completely different arena and world that exists out here. Um, so what would you say are like the pros and cons for music producers in particular who are tired of the, doing the placement game in the traditional sense of working with major label artists? What would yeah. you say are the pros and cons for them? Um, I think the... I, I feel like you just, you have to be flexible. Um, so the pros and, and I've have I've had some major placements as well. I've done some stuff. Tamar Braxton case and um, Dondre and Nicole TC. Um, and, and those were great, great opportunities, great experiences. Um, the thing for me, man, was the pro is, you know, once you do get something that lands and in places, you know, you get depending on how many tracks you do on, on the album, you can get a, a decent chunk of money up front, especially if you're you're independent and, you know, you don't have a, a, a advance to recoup. You know, you get that chunk of money up front and, um, and, and you're good until the next one. The thing is, you, you have limited control over when the next one happens, mm -hmm. um, at least for me. I, you know, everybody's experience is different. Everybody's path is different. But for me, um, I felt like <clears throat> one of the one of the cons with chasing major placements was the amount of time I was putting into creating music and, and sending it and pitching it um, and going back and forth with A&Rs and the labels and the battles that the labels and the artists are having. Yeah. All, the, all that time spent, man, I could have made... 10 20 30 tracks sent them off to tv and, and let them do their thing and i'm not worrying about it you know what i'm saying it'll mm -hmm. get used eventually um and i wasted a lot of time doing that so you know yeah you can get some some decent pay once the placement hits but the placement has to hit you know and they can pull a song last minute um and then you have to another con for me was waiting on the record labels to actually cut the check a lot of times the album already out already people already enjoying it right and um you still going back and forth with with attorneys and the labels and things like that just trying to get paid for it so um it was just i i didn't see the the value um in doing that on a regular basis and i was moving into you know 
getting married soon. So I'm like, yo, like I need to <laughs> I need something that's a little more <laughs> predictable, man. Yeah, yeah, because so, that, that's the one thing that's the most predictable is the unpredictability within the music industry, the traditional yeah. one, I, I would say. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned a little bit about the placements and very casually. I, I, that was probably the most casual uh, placement list I've ever heard in my <laughs> life. And I, that was, I, I applaud you for that because you dropped some heavy hitter names in a mix of that. Um, just to kind of contrast, first question I have for you is what are some of the major label artists that you have had the opportunity to work with? Mm -hmm. And then I want to contrast that with what are some of the major brands that you've worked with as uh, in, in, within music licensing? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so my first major introduction to the major, the industry, right. Was, um, was actually with <clears throat> my guy, uh, Dwight Scrap Reynolds. Um, so this, this was back in the Ustream days. I was still in Columbus, Ohio. Mm. So I used to go on Ustream and just cook up, bro. And just, you know, create. Oh yeah, my God. Ustream. I I said, you, you just, my brain opened up a part of it when you said that. <laughs> Ustream. Yes, bro. Ustream. I don't even know if they're still around, but <laughs> I would be on Ustream. I would cook up. Um, so my guy Scrap came through. He would come through, um, and we would just kind of check each other's streams out. Um, I didn't really know. I didn't know who he was at the time. So he's just coming through. Um, so I'm working on this this neo soul R and B vibe joint, and he's like, "Yo," he was like, "Do this sound like music soul child?" He's like, "You need to send send it over." Come to find out, he's like, he's like, he's produced for Akon, uh, shoot, uh, Whitney Houston, uh, Usher, like a bunch of people, right? So right. he's a heavy hitter, man. So he's just like, yo, send it to me. I'm gonna write a record to it. Send it to him the same night. He wrote, he wrote the hook, if not most of the record. Um, sent it back and uh, wrote this whole song. So then he ended up running into an exec in Atlanta because he was based in Atlanta, um, and then. Long story short, pulled a, pulled a play together. Um, Music Soul Child was in the studio in the next, I don't know, couple weeks, few weeks, cutting the record. Mm -hmm. So that was my first introduction to like the music major industry. Um, so we were going through that, and that for me was a sign. I was like, okay, I'm on the right track. This is something I can do professionally, right? Um, so that record didn't end up getting placed. Um, music and his label was in the middle of a of a battle. Like he wanted to do something different creatively. Mm -hmm. They was trying to keep him in classic music mode. So, um, so that didn't happen. Um, but after that, I moved to Atlanta, and then um, from there, I ended up um, doing some stuff with uh, Tyon Christian. Did a contest he was having. He's a songwriter, TC. If you if you haven't heard of him, okay. he's written for Justin Bieber, Brandy, everybody. Um, so I did a contest. <clears throat> with to do a remix for a, a song that he wrote or recorded or something like that it was a brandy joint and um i didn't win i came in second on the contest but he liked my version so much that he posted it anyway and That's then a, we got a bunch of positive <laughs> feedback from it and um uh, you man, might as well so give me the that, w at that point <laughs> Say that again. You might as well give me the W at that point. You wanna? <laughs> I know, right? I know. I, I so yeah, I won like passively, right? Right, uh, right, right. Be in second place, but so so yeah. So we started doing a bunch of remixes, man, and okay. um, something happened. He was he was out in New York working on Tamar Braxton's Christmas album. So he was just like, "Yo, I have this Christmas song." Um, have yourself a merry little Christmas. He was just like, do your thing to it, send it back to me. Mm -hmm. I'ma let um I'ma let Vincent Herbert hear it. So I was like, cool. So I did the thing. Vincent loved it. He was just like flying out to New York to work on a Christmas album. So he flew me out to New York. Wow. And then <laughs> yeah, we locked us in the studio and I ended up getting four tracks placed on Tamar Braxton's Christmas album. Ooh. So then that happened. While that was happening, an A and R came across the remix that I did for TC, and then that ended up turning into a case placement. <clears throat> um, I think it was Heaven's Heaven's Doors. Um, so we got one placed on there. Um, and then one of the Christmas songs that we did for Tamar's Bra Braxton's album, didn't make the album, but then Dondria went and cut that. Um, and then that turned into Ain't, no, I'm sorry. 
I think it was the track that didn't get placed. Mm -hmm. um, and then we wrote Ain't No Way. Um, TC wrote Ain't No Way to the, and I produced the music. Um, and then Dondre and Nicole cut that. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of how that how that happened, man. So you, you you're finding success in this realm, and you kind of already talked about what made you pivot. What does it look like on the other side of things in terms of uh, the 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 music licensing and sync? What opportunities yeah. have you been able to create through that world? Like who have you worked with there? Yeah, it's been crazy. So um, been able to. Produce music for Keeping Up with the Kardashians, um, you know, Fox Sports, Thursday Night Football. Um, let's see, um, some some CBS specials. Uh, let's see, Black Ink Crew, Love and Hip Hop Atlanta. Um, did a, like a short like ad um, campaign spot for Adidas. Um, just finished up. Um, uh, I don't think I, I can't talk about that. Yet, NDAs, but, um, NDAs. <laughs> it's a, a, yeah, yeah. But yeah, we did. It's a, another ad for a, um, a basketball player. But um, yeah, man. And all the, the NBC, NFL Network, uh, Fox Sports, CBS, um, and all of them, man. So I, right. I can't. I don't keep track. Of <laughs> and that's what your website is for, anyways. Which I, I have it yeah. up here. This, that's the pre. I just wanted to get. I want them to get an idea before we start to tackle some of these questions that are sitting here inside of my list. I know the audience has questions for you. We want to yeah, respect your time. Uh, but we want to make sure that, you know, we kind of get some 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 context first. Yeah. That being said, though, how does a music producer get started in music licensing? What would be your suggestion for them? <clears throat> I'm going to tell you the easiest way to start, man, because there's a lot of different paths. You know, a lot of people say music supervisor or you know, a film director, things like that. These people are extremely busy and they already have a lot of their relationships established. Mm -hmm. So the easiest way to get started is to go through a company who already has the relationships established with the music supervisors, the editors, the directors, and things like that. And those companies are music licensing companies, um, music libraries, um, production music companies. These are like kind of the terms that they go by. Um, you know, sync licensing companies, sync licensing libraries. And these are companies that pretty much house a bunch of music and they provide it to all of their clients. Wow. And then, you know, you pretty much you pr present your music to them. If they like it and they, they see it valuable, they'll do a deal with you. They'll sign that music. And then when their clients have needs, they'll either, you know, pitch your music in a, a bundle of music or their clients would come to their website, search for different keywords and things like that, and then your music could pop up, and then they can use it that way. Um, and then they pretty much handle all of the licensing and stuff for you. So you you create, send it to the library, and then the library handles the publishing. They, essentially, they become your publisher. Excuse are, me. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yep. Are there? What are sort of the major players in that that you would kind of direct? folks too. I'm sure there's like more details of course in the courses we're going to talk about that. But yeah. um what are some of like the major players for them to start keeping an eye on uh, in terms of submitting? Yeah, there there's so many of them. You know, you have newer ones, you have older ones, but you know, some of the major ones you know, that I work with um BMG Production Music is is one. Um honestly, most of the major labels, major publishers have a sync licensing division. Mm. So, BMG Production Music is one. Um Sony has a sync division. You may have to kind of be in with Sony to to get in touch with them. But um, Universal Production Music, um, they have one. One of the big popular companies when I was kind of getting started was Jingle Punks. Um, so you have them, mm -hmm. uh, companies like the Producers Toolbox, um, <clears throat> also known as Flavor Lab. Uh, you have, man, it's a lot. You got uh let's see lab hits apm music is like a distributor but if you go to to like a, i think it's apmmusic.com or something or just google apm music mm -hmm. you'll see the catalog of all the libraries the music licensing companies that they work with um and sometimes you can you know find those libraries and reach out to them directly sweet sweet man that's great yeah. information uh so let's just kind of naturally progress that a producer signs up to one of these set websites they see an opportunity that fits their genre and their alley and they want to submit. 
they know that there's tons of submissions that are making their way through. And as you stated earlier, a lot of the sound is about what the client wants. And I think just from an outsider standpoint, when I listen, because I've had some stuff placed in that in that realm, but it's not really my specialty, which is why, of course, you're here. Um, But what I've noticed is that when you listen to the libraries, a lot of them start sounding like either really, really cheesy or like too deliberate by the instructions and it kind of loses its uniqueness. What would you say are some tips that you have for a music producer who signs up to one of these websites, these libraries, and they want to kind of stand out amongst the crowd? Yeah, that's that's good. Um, And I feel like it it has had that reputation of sounding corny. And they're like, you know, they're trying to get away from that. Now they're trying to sound like what's hot on the radio, what's Mm. hot on the, the billboard charts. So I think to help you stand out, don't think of it a lot of producers make this mistake and they they compartmentalize producing music for tv and the music that they normally produce right they feel like oh since i'm making music for tv like i gotta make it sound like a a certain way and you do to an extent but Mm -hmm. what it's really about is doing you you know and and there's there's two sides to this right because you may do something that is so far left that nobody needs it and right. you're not you're not going to see success right so it's probably been it me still a few has, times. <laughs> it still has to be something that you know that they would they would use right so right. if you produce in a genre that you know tv and film uses hip hop you know do hip hop how you do hip hop do mm. boom bap how you do boom bap do pop music like you do pop music do pop rock how you you know what i'm saying so do you the difference is in how you structure what you do. That's the main thing that keeps producers from getting, hearing that yes from the music libraries um, because they're still structuring their music like they're producing for artists. And there's a difference there. Um, not necessarily in the style or the sound sonically, but it's it's in the structure and making sure it's, it's functional for editors. Absolutely. We can, and we can dig into- Man, you know, you know we will. I'm about to say, you know we will, because uh, first and foremost, uh, 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 chat community, uh, this is we're only halfway down this this, and he's already blessed us with so many gems. Uh, as you can imagine, the course material, which you can get more information in, and we're going to talk about those specifically, has got to be packed with that much more. Uh, grateful once again to have you here, because I know a lot of my audience, man, when I do these beat critiques, they send me stuff that I'm like. Yeah, I can't necessarily hear an artist on this, but I for sure see this in 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 TV commercial. But yeah. even then, I, I noticed that, you know, when I got my placement with uh, with Levi's and Justin Timberlake, okay. they wanted a TV mix, and I was like, "What the hell is that?" <laughs> I was like, "What do you mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> do you want me to take? You want me to turn my drums down and take the life out of them? Like, what do you?" And so they actually had an engineer who took my beat and gave it a TV mix. So not specifically about that, but in general, is there a different approach to mixing those beats when you're mixing them for these opportunities? Is my question for you. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think certain frequencies may be distracting. So if you if for example, if you have a synth sound and it's like real buzzy and hissy and on the like heavy on the high end and the, mm-hmm. the mid highs and things like that, you may have to tone that down because that could be distracting, especially when you have dialogue over it. So mm-hmm. things like that in the mix, you know, they would probably want different. Sometimes if they're asking for a TV mix or uh, a, an underscore mix, they want less instrumentation. So you may take out your main uh, your main melody in that track or your main synth lead or something like that to where it sounds it sounds empty to you because you're like yo like something's missing but for them and for the use someone's talking over it right so they don't need everything in there to give that scene the vibe or the mood that they want to that they want to give it so they may have you you know just subtract some of the sound so that it's uh it fits well with with dialogue so usually when they're talking tv mix and and alt mixes that's kind of what they're referring to Sweet, sweet. That's great information once again. Uh, a, a buddy of mine, OG out here, uh, that goes by Tumex, he gave me probably one of the biggest gems in 
he said, if you're going to go in that world, because I guess he got a lot of music placed uh, as an artist. Okay. He's like, if you're going to go in that world, you need to make sure that you organize your beats and folders that are like randomized, like card chasing or uh, uh, luxurious and whatnot. I'm curious if you have sort of like a similar formatting to it since it, it seems like this this world and this realm has a completely it, it's like using a different part of your brain. You're not yeah. thinking about an artist of, OK, this will be the, this artist. You're more so thinking about different scenarios that probably overlap at some points in time. Is there a special organization to how you kind of, I guess, um, pre-organize these before you submit? <clears throat> um, that's a great question. I think yes, to an extent. Um, I, and that's great advice to to have that in mind when you're you're organizing your music is to keep in mind the mood or the types of scenes that it could be used for so that when you are pitching, you're pitching for something that's relevant to what they're asking for. Um, but for me, I, I create a lot based off of briefs. So I'm going off of that. And then usually, you know, I may put that in a folder, um, you know, genre wise, but then when it comes time to do metadata and that's pretty much the descriptive things you know needed for the song the, right. the artist writer info mood keywords uh bpm things like that um that's where that really comes into play and every company has their their own format on how to submit that but that's where you you have the different moods um maybe you know artists that it sounds like or you know different different vibes that they would people would search when they're looking for this music. Like, how does this track make you feel? Does it make you feel sad? Does it make you feel happy? Does it make you, does it feel suspenseful? Like you don't know what's gonna happen next. Is it dramatic? You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I think when it's time to do do that metadata and, and have those keywords, that's what, what really plays a role into, you know, where that music ends up and how it's found. Sweet. So I just have yeah. a few more questions for myself and I want to open it up to a quick Q&A from the, from the audience, from the community. This yeah. is a personal question I have for you dealing with this world. OK, yeah. this is producer to producer, man to man. How in the hell do you translate these things that they request of you when it's not <laughs> from music brains like, bro, they'll send me things like I, I never forget. I always use this reference. I never say the company, but I use this reference. They told me. Hey, Curtis, we want something that sounds like a uh, gangster. Like we want something that sounds dark. And I was like, sure. Um, <laughs> what's your references? Because my references is like, you know, DPG, uh, 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 you know what I'm saying? Dub C and like West Coast, like like OG West Coast gangster hip hop. And they sent me B.O.B. Oh, my gosh. And Lil Wayne. And at that time, there was a song they had together that was just like, so do you just mean dark? Like I, it was hard for me to translate this from yeah. people who are not in our world, who don't speak producerese. Yep. How do you do this? Because it is called that has probably been the one thing that has stopped me from going full force in this world is the issue of sometimes I wish I could just, you know, not have the professional layer on me and just say, what the hell are you, what, what do you want? <laughs> like, what is, what is this? What is this? What is this, what, <laughs> what, what is this description right now? We want a little bit more of the, duh, 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 duh. what is the, duh, 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 duh. like yeah, talk to me. Exactly. So how are you able to sort of, um, <laughs> be the, uh, the, the, the client whisperer that you are, cause you have executed on this multiple times. And yeah. there's been a lot of times that I've got the no, because I just really could not translate what their goal was how were you able yeah. to translate that that's that's the challenge man that's one of the challenges in, in working in this space um what helps a lot and, and i think you did a, a good thing what's your references of that because dark i mean <clears throat> when i hear dark i think minor chords right minor right, minor right. keys so usually that's kind of what they're referring to um, but you know, gangster, that could be subjective. You know, a lot of, a lot of descriptive <laughs> words can be subjective, um, uh, depending on <laughs> what's, what side of the country you're on. So, um, you know, what helps a lot and, and what I would always ask if they don't send music or examples, mm -hmm. ask them if they have examples for what they're looking for, mm -hmm. because nine times out of 10, when you listen to something, 
okay, you're going to know exactly what they're looking for. Like if they give you a specific artist, um, you're going to know, okay, this is kind of what they're looking for. And I'll give you guys a trick that I use when they give me examples of music um, called references. That's what we call it in this space is just references. So I'll listen. I'll take the track. I'll listen to it. There's a few things that I'm listening for. I'm listening for the BPM. So as it's playing, I'm tapping my my metronome app on the phone. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm listening to the key of the song because a lot of times when they send references over, especially if it's like one or two, these are tracks that they've temporarily placed in a scene that they like, but Mm. they just can't afford the budget to clear it or go through the process to clear it from the major artists. So they've been living with this track for, for days, for weeks, months, whatever. So... If you can match that key and give it that same vibe, give it that same tempo, it's going to be a breeze when they place it up there and it's it's lining up with everything, you know, based on how they cut those scenes. So, um so I listen for the BPM. I'm listening for the uh for the key of the song, and then I'm listening for the instrumentation that's being used in that song. So if you got something say for sports, something that's real heavy on the brass tabs, um, or the the orchestral strings and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, does it have 808? Does it have live bass? Does it, you know, what kind of drums are they using? Those are things that I'm looking for. And then I'll take that <clears throat> and then create my own thing based off of, of those few elements and just create something new that right. still has that same vibe because you have the same instrumentation, you have the same key, you have the same BPM. Wish, wish I had a friend like you earlier in this journey because you would have <laughs> saved me a lot of pulling out my my hair because yeah. uh it's just you, you 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 get in these conversations and it's like I don't know what you want but <laughs> if I say that then it's like well maybe you're not the right person for this job so you just you kind of just stop and you just say okay well let's keep working with it but it can be really frustrating but even yeah. just saying that having a system approach and and it, it, it's funny because you know even though of course, you made me an affiliate for the course. That wasn't the purpose of us having the conversation. This, the purpose of it was us, me having these critiques, and, and everybody kept submitting things that everybody in here kept saying, hey, this should go on video games. This should go on TV. I don't have the answers for you, Sway, but Clint <laughs> does have the answers for you, and you also have courses that align with that. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to actually jumping into courses because I've already gotten so much free game from just your Instagram which, by the way, that's up there at the top on, on a daily basis. And it's like every time you drop something else, I'm like, God, is this another sign? This is what I'm supposed to get into because <laughs> the, the last situation I had, I, you know, like I said, there's NDAs and all of that. But yeah. it was a month long process. And I was like, uh, yeah. this is t- it was a good chunk of change, but it, it took away from everything else. And I had to ask myself, is this what I really wanted out yeah. of music? So you, you get into those questions. But um you have two courses in particular that I've pointed out, uh, okay. Road to Ten Placements, and then what was the first one? Can you remind me what the name of the first one was again? Um, so we got Road to Ten Placements, and then we have How to Structure Instrumentals for How TV. How to Structure Instrumentals for TV. Uh, what can someone expect? Like, what is what is that going to help <laughs> with for those who are interested in getting in this world? Yeah, so Road to Ten Placements, um, a lot of people ask me, like, why 10? So the story behind that is – when I got that first placement on on the NFL Network and Fox Sports, that was that was the pivotal point for me where I was just like, okay, I want to focus on this, so let me set a goal that'll keep me on track and kind of keep me inspired. Mm-hmm. And I, I was like, I want to get 10 TV placements in a year. That was the goal. So during this process, I was literally documenting everything I was doing to get to 10 placements, right? Like you know, what kind of, what kind of music am I making? How am I making the music? How am I going to send the music to pitch it? Um, You know, how many companies am I pitching to every day? How am I reaching out to them? What am I saying in my emails? Like I'm just documenting all this stuff and I was sharing it on, on social media and stuff too. And um, people just kept asking me questions like, yo, like, yo, this is dope. Like it's inspiring. Excuse me. Like, how are you, how are you doing this? Um, so I just like kept sharing and then eventually I got to the point I was like, yo, like if I repeat myself one more time, I'm like, let me just put this in one spot, man. I'm gonna just give y'all everything I did, right. my entire process from uh from A to Z, man, how to produce, prepare, and pitch placement ready music. And I threw it in the road to 10 placement. So you're gonna learn 
you know, how to produce music, how to prepare it, how to make sure you're minimizing rejection from publishers, you know, how to make sure you have your business lined up so you can get paid your royalties and things like that. Um, showing you some organizational things that can help you, um, you know, from a from an organizational standpoint, because it can get mad confusing submitting music to multiple different companies. So um, breaking down the, the the types of deals you can see um, and what those look like <clears throat> and then just giving you uh, just helping helping you with your mindset going into this, because a lot of people want to get into it because they hear about the fat sink fees and all that stuff. And, you know that's dope but you you have to be prepared to be in it for the long run because it it is slow starting out um, right. especially on the like the the tv instrumental side um it's dope but you you can't you can't hop in this for like two months and be like okay <laughs> life should change by now you <laughs> you're gonna quit so be prepared to put in a few years of work before you start seeing the traction that you want to see um, and that could be different for everybody because, again, there's different lanes. You may want to focus on advertising, which mm -hmm. has way higher fees and things like that, bigger budgets. Um, or you may want to focus on trailer music, which is a different lane, a totally different beast. Um, so it just depends on which direction you take. So you're going to get that in Roll to 10 Placements. And then How to Structure Instrumentals for TV. That's a video course where you're going to show, I'm going to show exactly how I structure every beat that I submit out for TV. Um, including that one. Um, so there's certain things <clears throat> that editors are looking for, um, short intros, they're looking for your track to build and progress um, and, you know, have breakdowns and, and just have dynamics to a track. Mm -hmm. There's a certain way you want to end your tracks with a sting ending. I'll show you exactly how to build out a sting ending for all of your tracks. Um, so I'm walking you through all of the things you need to start getting your music placed in TV. And it's been able to help a lot of producers. Um, I know my guy, Walt Woods, he's been crushing it. He had, I think he had like over 200 something placements um, last year or the year before. Um, landed one on an Oculus video game. I don't, nice. I don't even know, I, I don't do video game music. He, he took the information and ran with it, man, so. <laughs> It's, so it's there's a dope, lot of those man. in here. There's a lot of potential ones in here because there's a lot of submissions <laughs> I get that I'm like, man, this is this is video game menu music for sure. Like, yeah, man, I don't mean that in, in any disrespect. It's just this is what it is. Like when I hear it yep. in that context, I'm like, it makes so much more sense. Yeah. Um, so I'm waiting for some questions to come in here. I got a few that I've already been asked throughout the duration of our interview. We appreciate your time so much and this Absolutely. information, bro. Um, Absolutely. What advice would you give young Clint? Now that you see the other side of this, you know, one thing I got to say, as I, as I went through the archives of your uh, of your interviews and your videos, one thing I got to say is besides the music being consistent, besides your evolution being consistent, that beard, bro, that beard, bro, <laughs> that beard is amazing, bro. Like, I appreciate you know what I'm saying? I, I, you had me looking at mine this morning like, am I prepared for this interview today? And, uh, you know, I failed that. So. Props on that. You got the cleanest producer beard in the business, first and foremost. The producer beard. Come I on, love man. That's like hilarious. you gotta own that's just that's just that's yours. That that crown is 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 not for the taking. I'm sorry for Listen, whoever is, is I, working I, on that. I, I worked hard on this beard, man. It took years before I got some facial hair. So I proudly wear this beard. <laughs> it took me years before mine started connecting. So I you know, I, I understand that. But what advice would you give the younger you that was so wrapped up in being the next this and, and wanting to get into the traditional industry of things and you pivoting the way you have, man, and, and, and mm -hmm. teaching and giving value and just being prolific in so many different ways. What advice would you give your younger self? Be open, be flexible, man, um, and, and look for ways to give value. Um, when you When you approach everything looking for you know what can i get out of this it does it never works out man so you have to approach everything to you know like how can i help man how can i give value how can i serve other people and solve their problems and that has completely changed my career man nice nice yep dm beats who is someone that uh is in this world as well he has a question for you Yep. He says, what would you say, I said, would you say that having sync placements can set you up better for arts, artist placements more than the other way around? Absolutely. Artist placements to sync licensing, what do you think of that? Um, <clears throat> absolutely. I, I, think, I think sync placements 
can absolutely set you up for the artist stuff because you know what a lot of producers don't realize is okay it's not a major artist but how many people do you know knows how to get their music placed on NBC or Fox mm. Sports or NFL Network right so when you walk into a room with the credentials connected to these major networks these major TV show franchises they can look at you like this dude knows something that like apparently he's professional because he's partnered up with like the biggest networks in the world you know mm. what I mean so that adds a massive amount of value to your brand as a producer and it can definitely open up other doors man um I mean, yeah, dude. I mean, I've had I've had major artists, major producers, you know, reach out like like how do you do this? Like I want our music um placed in in TV and film and things like that because it's it's just a space that a lot of people don't understand how to navigate. Um so if you can figure out a way to get in there and and you know, get those those placements and and use them as leverage, man, to open up other doors. Absolutely. Nice. Nice. Uh Edwin Devon says I'm an artist, and I'm curious to know, how would my approach to getting sync placements differ from a music producer? How would your approach? Oh, he's an artist. So an artist, uh -huh. um, the major difference with artists, right, you can still use the same approach, the easiest way, you know, going through music libraries and things like that. But what you want to look for when you're searching for the music libraries is making sure that they represent full songs um, a, a lot there's a lot of like boutique libraries where they represent artists and they they want to help artists and kind of be um <clears throat> kind of be helpful in their branding and their marketing through sync right so sometimes you can link up with some of those smaller boutique libraries that focus on artists and and link up with them and then they'll work with you to get your music placed in in you know places that match your your brand nice we just got a few more here uh one from Toronto high top he said, seems like he was all pedal to the metal. Was there any slow point where sync didn't feel sustainable? If so, how did you push through it? Yeah, absolutely. Like the first five years. Because <laughs> <laughs> listen, man, like, you know, it, it takes. So I, I want to give you guys like a breakdown of how this works. It's not here's my music, place it, pay me immediately. It's like. You you get you work on your music, you get your music where it needs to be so a library can say yes and do a deal with you. Mm -hmm. Then that music may sit in the library for a few months, for a couple years. You don't know. You know what I mean? Um, so there's that process. They have to get it in their catalog. They have to make sure all the metadata, all the writer's information is right. They have to register those those works with the PROs. You know, there's a lot of admin work that goes into that upfront process. And then, you know, say you actually get the placement, right? <clears throat> say we got a placement today. You heard it, you seen it, it aired today. It could be, I don't know, however long it takes for the production company to submit what's called a cue sheet. That's the sheet that has all the pieces of music that was used in that episode, right? Okay. The production company has to submit that to the pros. Sometimes they're slow in doing that. So, if they submitted it on time in a timely manner, you know, you could you could see anywhere from six to nine months before the royalties, the back end royalties from that placement wow. um, come. Yeah. And a lot of the reality TV stuff, you don't you don't see a lot of upfront fees unless it's like a song, full song. And they're kind of like using it in a like a featured use or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the background, you it, it depends. It, it depends on the situation, but a lot of the, like background instrumental stuff that you hear on like love and hip hop, you're not going to see a lot of upfront money on that. It's going to be mostly a, ba a back end play. So um, expect, you know, six to nine months after that placement, after they turn those cue sheets in to see royalties from it. And then over time, it starts to add up, you know, your first royalty check, it'll be like 57 cents. You'll be OK. Just keep going. <laughs> and then Jesus. it jumps up to a couple hundred and it may go up. Um, a couple hundred more, then it may go down, and you're like, oh, shoot. <laughs> then it'll shoot up exponentially, and you're in the thousands, and it's just like, okay. Um, so it, it can ebb and flow. You just, you know, you have to be committed to it. If if, you, if this is what you want to do, put in the work and um, and, and, and watch, you know, the, the fruits of your labor, um, you know, happen. So Nice, nice. Uh, Stepadon Diggity, how do you tell the difference between 
bad business and good business in terms of sync licenses? <clears throat> um, shoot, people who people who get scared when you mention an, an attorney or paperwork, um, people who who want to skip steps in the process of registering works and split sheets and agreements. You know, I think those are some of the things. But to be honest with you, 100 percent on the sync side, I have not had any issues as far as the business is concerned it, wow. it's been one of the most straightforward professional uh processes my bad um, good, that good. that i've been a part of when it comes to uh to producing music and, and that's what i love about it so much you know the, the people are cool and, and yeah man it's just a mutual understanding like we're all professionals here let's get the work done and let's make sure everybody is properly compensated for it that was one of my bit that was, that was one of the biggest appeals to me when I first started doing business there. I had came from just nothing but an artist background. Yeah. And when I went in here, I was like, finally, finally, <laughs> this is where this is where a professionalism is appreciated. Because with artists, yeah. it's like I was the one st showing up on time and I was kind of ridiculed to a certain level for being too professional, for being mm. too, you know, reliable, I guess, <laughs> whatever that means. Uh no. but in this realm, like they it, it's just they're operating business differently, and I guess it's because of, you know, there's things like the Better Business Bureau and, and, and things that I guess put an extra pressure on that world when you decide that you want to kind of do that side of business. Uh, there's yeah. different expectations, it seems. And I know that every company's not the same. I've worked with some that are, remind me a lot of my rapper relationships, but um, for the most part, man, that, that's, that's the blessing it seems to be working with that. Yep. So Absolutely. One last question, and we want to say thank you once again and get all the, all your information. This is from General Jam the Jet. How do you approach naming your cues slash beats when submitting to a library? Even it's think about question. that one. That's a great question. Uh, yeah, yeah, and that's a that's a dope name. Too. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was a tongue twister just trying to get that one out, but that's dope. <laughs> Indeed. So yeah, when when I'm naming when you're naming your beats, right? You want to make sure you're naming them something that hints to the vibe and the mood that you know an editor is going to get. So like if they're scrolling through a bunch of music and they see <laughs> and they see Jets beat fifty seven, you know, and the the date and time, like they're gonna scroll past that. Don't name your beats. <laughs> the date that you created them and throw your name on there. Name them something that's gonna be descriptive, you know, something like uh, Dark Mysterious Nights or something, I don't know, man, mm -hmm. like something that just hints at what they're gonna feel when they when they hear that track. Uh, champions always win. Like, what do you feel when I say champions always win? Mm -hmm. You think of sports, you think of conquering, taking over, you think hype, you know what I'm saying? So. Approach it that way when you're naming your tracks. And, and make sure you take your producer tags out, too. They don't like producer tags. Oh. <laughs> just, just, just a little last-minute tidbit that, that might have changed somebody's life. <laughs> well, man, we, we certainly, certainly appreciate your time. We appreciate this information. Please let the folks know where they can find you, connect with you, as well as uh, some last bits of, 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 of encouragement for those who are like, this is the thing for me, and I'm getting ready to get into it uh, based upon your courses or your information. So, yeah, just those two. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. So you can find me, um, clintproductions.com. Um, I'm on Instagram at Clint Music, here on YouTube, Clint Music. Uh, so those are, yeah, I'm, I'm hanging out there here, YouTube and Instagram the most. Um, and then, yeah, man, I guess my, my last words is <clears throat> if you're going to do this and, and you're serious about it, Go into it um, believing that you can do it because you can. If if you go into it like, I don't know if I can, I, I can't, then then you won't. And then you'll end up stopping. But, um, you know, there's only there's only three things, three reasons why you would get rejected. Either your music's not ready, um, either, you know, the publisher's just not looking for music at the time um, or you know, you may have to, you may have to restructure how you're how you're producing the music, and, and you know, I teach you those things in the the how to structure for instrumentals for TV course. But those are the only reasons, and all those things you have control over. You know, you can go and work on your craft and get your production better. You can get better sounds. You know, you can up your mixing game and things like that. So, 
any obstacle that you run into, you know, you have a uh, you have control to to make the the changes that you need to to be able to see success in this space and you know stick with it, uh, be in it for the long run, and I wish you the best and much success. Man, thank you so much again. And community, also, thank you so much for tuning in and for asking such great questions. I will keep this up here so that you can go ahead and review it. Man, Clint, we we I feel like this ain't the last time. We're going to for sure have to dive in a little bit deeper at some point uh, yeah, because we got some surface level things. But you're always welcome to the community, no matter what you have on board. Just know that you always have another space here uh, to express all that good stuff. So we thank you, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate you for having me, man. Of course. All right, community, I will be talking to you soon.